everybody to the AMC house. Um, I, just a couple things before we get started. I wanted to introduce somebody new we had this year. We had Adam Novi back, standing back there over there. He's our new curator, and he's here to help make sure that all of our um, artifacts are preserved the right way. He's helping with some great events, um, planning some great things for next year, so that's what he's been doing. Um, a couple of things in the front, we have a, a t-shirt drawing. If you'd like, we have these brand new t-shirts with the, with the portage on the t-shirt. Um, if you'd like to have one, we have a drawing in the front um, for a t-shirt tonight. And then on your seat, you saw some little blue cards. Those are some events that we still have coming up for the rest of the year. And at the end, well, we'll talk, but I'll introduce Pete Schrake. He's our speaker tonight. Um, he is an uh, archivist with the um, Circus World and the author of this wonderful book, So the Man, which is about John Kinsey's life. And if you buy a book tonight, you might be able to convince him to autograph it when he becomes famous someday. <laughs> These are our first edition, by the way. Yes, they are. They're first edition, so they're. There's only been one edition. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure we can kill sign any books that um, we talk about tonight. And. With that, we're gonna. Pete's gonna talk about the um, American Fur Com American Fur Company in this area. And, uh, thanks for coming. Today. Well, thank you all for coming. And you know, it's it is always always a pleasure to come back to the Agency House Museum to do public programming and talk. But it's because of the Agency House Museum that I was able to publish this book. It was through their generous donations, their funds, uh, that actually funded the project. And, I always offer a bit of an explanation. I'm the archivist at Circus World Museum, and I do circus work in my day job. At night, when I'm at home, I play with Jacksonian Indian policy in early 19th century America, which leads to sometimes very confused brain because I'm not really sure. And if you get to know me, you realize how absent-minded I am. Well, that's why. Um, but it's it's wonderful to be back here. It's been a number of years, and it's it's wonderful to see the, the great things that are happening here. And, and to show you how long it's been. Last time I was here, the new sidewalk was not even on the front. But to see a curator here, to see and hear about the archaeological work that's being done, it's exciting. For a place like this, which is something of obviously great personal interest to me, to see stuff happening. Uh, so, yeah, I appreciate the Agency House inviting me back and talking about a subject uh, that actually, up until the invitation to come, I did not know that much about, uh, which actually is something, too, touching upon the book. Uh, and I've heard other authors make similar comments is that when your project is done, it's after the fact that you find. You know, some new important batch of papers, or you notice some significant omission. You know that you that you left out of the book. Uh, and tonight's story is actually one of those circumstances. When you read through Silverman, you'll find precious little about the American Fur Company, uh, which is a shame because actually, I mean, I do talk about Kinsey's role, uh, but I don't talk about any interrelations that he may have had with the trading post that was here. Uh, and that's really a shortcoming on my part, I'll fully admit. But that's also, I think, a good introduction because when you look at history, history doesn't operate in a vacuum. Uh, things are interconnected, you know, and there was interconnections here. Uh, the fact that John Kinsey was an apprentice for the American Fur Company up at Mackinac Island, worked for the American Fur Company at Prairie Machine, when he came here, that certainly was one of the reasons why he was hired as an Indian agent, why he had to have been placed here, uh, and had to have associations either with Pierre Paquette, I mean, he certainly did, working association, but either prior to, perhaps, uh, and the fact that his agency was located on this side of the river, not by or within the fort, uh, all those means that there has to have been even more of a connection between the American Fur Company and the operations here at the Indian Agency Hub, so though that has yet to be determined, but things are connected. Uh, things don't just operate in a vacuum, uh, which really is also a good way to start this talk. Uh, when you look at events, look at personalities like John Kinsey, when you look at incidents or sites like the fur trading post or the fur trade, uh, there is an interconnection. And so in order to, to look at and understand a site, it's always good to understand its story within a broader context. So tonight I'm going to start from that 50,000 foot view and then drill down to what I've been able to learn about the fur trading post operations here. And that leads us to 
this man as our start, uh, and the American Fur Company, which was the brainchild of John Jacob Astor. Uh, the American Fur Company in its day uh, was uh, the country's first or nearly the first uh, monopoly uh, that existed within the United States. And John Jacob Astor was one of the earliest millionaires that this country produced. Uh, he was a native of Germany, uh, emigrated to the United States, comes to New York, and on the way over he meets someone who is involved in the fur trade and becomes fascinated by uh, this business uh, that is on the frontier. But he doesn't enter into the fur trade right away. He is a butcher's apprentice in Germany. He goes into the butcher business in New York. Uh, but very quickly, he demonstrates his uh, strong business acumen and uh, goes into a mercantile business, sells musical instruments, uh, and soon starts buying and selling fur peltries in his shop. And it's through that connection that he starts reaching out into the fur trade uh, business uh, in the Great Lakes area through the connections in Montreal and such. And over the years, he builds up an active trade uh, of buying and selling furs through his shop. Uh, and uh, it's a slow growth. Uh, he has some successes. He has some failures. He tries different fur companies. Uh, around 1811, he starts a venture to colonize the Pacific coast with Astoria uh, and the Pacific Fur Company doesn't entirely succeed, but all of these things build upon each other to the point in 1808 where he founds the American Fur Company with the blessings of Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and this is an important thing, not just business venture for him, but also for the United States. Within a few years, the American the, the country is again embroiled in a war with its old enemy, Great Britain. Uh, and we almost lose this war. You know, this is a war where Washington, D.C. is captured and burned. Uh, and so, in the eyes of the federal government, Great Britain is the great Satan you know, of, of the world at that time. Uh, and this is where the American Fur Company has uh, a, a, a strong connection. Why he has the support first of Thomas Jefferson and then later on uh, he's able to capitalize on a relationship in the United States government. Uh, as a result of both the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812, all of the Indian tribes that live on the frontier were aligned with Great Britain. So not only did you know, the Great Satan still exist up north in Canada, but all the Indian tribes on the frontier were aligned with them. Uh, and one way to gain access to them and effectively to eventually gain their allegiance and control was to engage them within the fur trade. And so if there could be a counter to the Hudson Bay Company and other British interests in the fur trade, that's good for the United States. And that's why Thomas Jefferson, amongst others, gave their blessings to uh, Astor's business uh, enterprise. Uh, and also to that point, in 1917, uh, they the con Congress passed an act uh, that prohibited foreign uh, fur companies or foreign companies from investing or participating in the fur company within the confines of the United States. Now this helps Astor. Uh, this helps Astor because this, this uh, essentially bars a significant competitor from engaging in the fur trade within American soil. Uh, so Astor not only has the blessings of the United States government, uh, he has federal legislation blocking a significant competitor, and so his company starts to grow. Uh, the company also has aggressive business tactics. There are many other fur companies that are operating on the frontier during this time period. Uh, and Astor uses aggressive tactics to either muscle them out uh, or simply to buy them up and to gobble them up. And so throughout, from 1808 steadily up until the 1820s, the American Fur Company is growing and growing and growing and more and more and more dominating the fur trade uh, in the Great Lakes frontier as well as farther west. Uh, and so we jump ahead though a little bit. That's just kind of a backstory of Astor. Uh, he is significant because the post that is here uh, ultimately falls under his purview. This is the American Fur Company trading post after 1821. Now, after the War of 1812, uh, after some fits and starts and evolutions and competitions, uh, the American Fur Company crystallizes really into three different groups. Uh, the Northern Department, which is the classic, what I call the classic American Fur Company, uh, that uh, covers fur trade operations in the Great Lakes area. That includes Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota, uh, essentially the central and western Great Lakes. The center of the administration for the American Fur Company of the Northern Department is Mackinac Island. By 1822, fur traders are pushing farther west, and they're now on the Missouri River. 
and their operations are significant enough where a second department, the Western Department, is founded uh, again for the Missouri River with their headquarters in St. Louis. St. Louis is a substantial community by uh, the 1820s. Uh, then a third unit is formed in 1827, the Upper Missouri Outfit. The Upper Missouri Outfit was technically a part of the Western Department. Uh, it was uh, a quasi-practically independent group that managed all fur trading affairs above the Big Sioux River, or essentially above Sioux City, Iowa. Uh, so although technically it was a part of the Western uh, Department, it was, it was pretty, for the most part, independent. But by the time this post is created, uh, by or created or absorbed, I should say, by the American Fur Company, this is the fur company that it was a part of. And it was a part of the Northern Department of the American Fur Company. More context, just as a background, a uh, little bit of geography. I always like to, when I talk about this era, throw up this map. Uh, this is the geographic world that uh, Paul Kett and Dubé and the other traders here would have lived in. Uh, and to give you a sense of just what maybe this world would have been like, there were only two major cities uh, in the upper Midwest at this time. Detroit, which was the territorial capital for the Michigan Territory. There, the seat of federal government for pretty much all of Michigan, Wisconsin, the UP, Minnesota, uh, was wrested out of Detroit. The other major community, this is Detroit in 1803. It's a smaller community at this point, uh, but by the 1820s, it's already grown. Uh, it was a center of operations around the War of 1812. The other major community is St. Louis. This is an image of St. Louis in 1825 to give you a sense of just how built up that community was at that point. It was also a center for government. Uh, the superintendent of Indian Affairs was based out of St. Louis. Louis uh, uh, William Clark, of Louis and Clark fame, uh, had his office out of St. Louis. Uh, this community dates back to the Spanish era. That's why it's already been built up. It's, and it's on the Mississippi River. So it's a substantial community by this point. But between Detroit and St. Louis, there's not much. You have Green Bay and Prairie du Chien as the main communities. You have Chicago, which is maybe a dozen huts at this point. Uh, the occasional federal outpost, Fort Snelling, up at Minneapolis, what is now Minneapolis, St. Paul, a fort at Chicago, a fort at Green Bay, a fort uh, at uh, Prairie du Chien, a fort at Rock Island. Uh, but And then beyond that, you have scattered fur trade outposts, uh, which is why I kind of like to title this an outpost of empire. Uh, it's not a federal empire, but at this point, uh, by 1820, uh, the American Fur Company was a mercantile empire, uh, almost effectively a power unto itself that could challenge federal authority. Indian agents, such as John Kinsey, uh, his compatriots, or colleagues, I should say, sometimes would challenge the American Fur Company to their peril and often would either get themselves dismissed or severely rebuked by their administrators. Uh, so this was a powerful entity, and the outpost here was a part of this empire that was emerging, this uh, economic empire uh, that was emerging. So this is the world that they lived in. You were surrounded by numerous different uh, Indian nations, uh, and the portage at the center is right in the midst of all of this. Of course, sitting astride a significant economic waterway of the Fox Wisconsin River. So. This post is a part of the Northern Department of the American Fur Company, and the center of that department at headquarters is Mackinac Island. Here we have a couple of images of buildings that still stand today. The American Fur Company offices and warehouses still stand, as does uh, the base level of the Fur Company store. That was actually a three-story building uh, at the time the company was in full operations. But you can actually still see American Fur Company building still at Mackinac. Uh, it was operated by these two men. Two men which I think were somewhat different from each other. Ramsey Crooks always struck me as a relatively uh, genteel, if not polished gentleman, perhaps, uh, in comparison to Robert Stewart, who was an irascible, crusty old Scotsman, who was very grumpy. Uh, both men were actually mentors to and bosses of John Kinsey. Kinsey actually lived with the Stewart family. Both men had long association with John Jacob Astor. Both go back to Astor's early colonizing and fur trading attempt efforts on the Pacific coast with Astoria. Ramsey Crooks would eventually be promoted uh, out of Mackinac Island and run the Western Department on the Missouri River. Robert Stewart would always remain in charge of the Mackinac Island operations and would essentially be the top administrative head for the department that this post fit in. 
This is a lovely image actually of Mackinac Island from around 1820. So here you have Fort Mackinac, the town where the fur trade companies would have been located. Uh, the traders here, Paquette, Dubé and such, this is how Mackinac Island would have looked to them, the fur traders. This would have been a familiar sight to them. Think of Mackinac Island not just as an administrative head but a distribution center. That is how Mackinac Island functioned within the American Fur Company. All furs in around the region funneled to them. And under Mackinac Island were trading outposts throughout the region. And beyond that, units called either outfits, sometimes also called brigades. These are individual independent teams that would go out into the field and conduct trade with the different Indian nations. Uh, this is actually an early, probably more French period painting, uh, romanticized painting, but still probably not too terribly inaccurate uh, of an outfit in the French period uh, out uh, in the field. Uh, but beyond these outfits, you would have had outposts or trading posts located throughout the region. And this is the, the in the field operation for the American Fur Company. Uh, you have outposts at Fond du Lac or Duluth. And this is an 1827 lithograph of Fond du Lac, uh, very much contemporary of this post. Uh, La Pointe in Madeline Island. So if you ever go up to the Apostle Isles and see Madeline Island, the community of La Pointe. Uh, was established there. And it can hard to tell in this painting, but there's an American flag right there. That is where the warehouse of the American Fur Company at the point would have been located. This is Milwaukee, uh, my hometown. Uh, and this is the Milwaukee River. And so right behind this hill and these cabins, that's Lake Michigan. And so that's the beginning. That's Solomon Juno's American Fur Company trading post at Milwaukee. Not extensive operations, but these were all contemporaries of the trading post that was established here. And the trading posts served several different purposes, uh, one of which was for indi to individuals, uh, individuals from the different Indian nations could come in to the trading posts and actually conduct business, bring in fur pelts and get supplies, uh, get tinware, get refiner metalwork, uh, get uh, guns, uh, get beadwork. Uh, get any sorts of a commodity that they may be interested in that the American Fur Company was willing to trade for their fur peltries. It is also a place for these individual outfits or brigades to come in as they're working out in the field uh, and need to acquire supplies uh, to trade with the Indians in the field and also to deposit their furs as they're collecting them throughout the year. If they're successful, they're gathering a stockpile. Uh, now, both in the case of uh, the individual Indians as well as the fur traders themselves, they would come into the outposts and to get new supplies on credit. And then to be settled and paid for at the end of the year when all the supplies were gathered and sent up to Mackinac Island where they would be counted, weighed, sorted, basically evaluated, and then sent off to New York City and then Europe. That's how essentially the fur trade within the American Fur Company worked. And as you can imagine, if it's working on credit, before too long, the individual traders and certainly the different Native Americans were in hop to the American Fur Company. Uh, and so often they were working at a disadvantage, but not to a disadvantage to the American Fur Company. Their job was to make money, and they certainly did while the fur trade was in full operation. So this is the world into which this post existed. Now, there are two other communities which I didn't mention, uh, which were uh, both relevant and important. One in particular more than the other. One is Green Bay that had a, a trading post. It was also one of those two main communities I mentioned. The other is Prairie du Chien. Prairie du Chien also had a trading outpost, a rather substantial one. Uh, trade, Prairie du Chien was an important center. It was neutral ground. It was a place where important treaties were negotiated and signed with different Indian tribes. Uh, here's just two images of Prairie du Chien. One in 1819. The American Fur Company would have had its office, its warehouses and trading posts in this area. Here is Prairie du Chien in 1846, around the time that the fur uh, trading post here probably was closing or was phasing out of its business. I offer this image uh, in 1900. This is the old American Fur Company warehouse as it would have appeared in 1900. But this gives you a semblance of the importance uh, that the, uh, the American Fur Company placed in Prairie du Chien and that it was substantial enough to build a stone warehouse to house the furs that were collected there. So Prairie du Chien was an important center of fur trading operations and even more important here because the leading agent at Prairie du Chien was a man named Joseph Roulette. Uh, so, uh, I like to use the term irascible, uh, it, but again, Krusty Kankanakuris 
Uh, you can use all sorts of colorful words to describe uh, people like Joseph Roulette, but he was the lead agent uh, at Prairie du Chien. Long time uh, uh, man working in the fur trade uh, independently for years. Uh, eventually, though, sells out to the American Fur Company, becomes the principal agent there. Uh, to give you a sense of uh, Roulette's personality, uh, Kinsey actually works for him when he's in the American Fur Company uh, in, the, in, the, in the 1820s. And Kinsey is a young man, you know, he's trying to essentially make his way in the world, establish himself as a young gentleman, gets the idea uh, of starting a Sunday school with the wives of the Army officers from Fort Crawford. Well, Roulette gets here, wind of this, and tries to put kind of the kibosh on it as quickly as he could. He did not like that idea, he opposed it. Why? Uh, in one part, he was Catholic, and Kinsey and many of the wives were Protestant. So religion had something to do with it. But also, as clearly indicated, it was not his idea. And even though something as benign as a Sunday school, I am not going to support it because it did not come from me. You know, that's Joseph Roulette. He was in command of that town. He had multiple business ventures, uh, and, and he was just that kind of a character. Well, Joseph Roulette was also the man that essentially established this place as uh, as an outpost for the American Fur Company. So now we get down to our trading post here. So we're drilling down to that local site. As far as I could determine, and I might be inaccurate in this, but there probably was a trading post here uh, at, in one form or another as far back as 1780. So that would probably be back to the French period. Uh, then as this area changed hands, British traders uh, would have operated here. Uh, by 1821, however, uh, Joseph Roulette owns this site. Uh, at some point prior to 1821, he acquires control of the trading post located here at the Port I've not been able yet to determine just when. Uh, however, in 1821, he sells this trading post to the American Fur Company, which is about the time that he joins partners with them in Prairie du Chien. Uh, and so he is the owner of the trading post here. Although we do not believe that he actually came up here very often, he had his own agents that would operate for him, and here's where Pierre Paquette comes into the figure. Uh, by 1828, we do have a description by a named John T. Laurent, who clerked, we believe, for at one point or another for Paquette. Uh, he places Paquette here as early as 1828. It's possible uh, that Roulette places Paquette here as 1821. I do have uh, some anecdotal uh, accounts of Paquette working in Prairie du Chien for Roulette uh, in the years after the War of 1812. Uh, I've not been able to fully substantiate that. One of the problems with uh, tracing uh, characters on the frontier is, is evaluating the different resources, uh, and some of these guys have sketchy histories. Uh, we don't know all about them yet. Uh, or at least I just haven't found the resources I need to find about them. Hence. The book, uh, as I mentioned that before. After this presentation, I'll find some troll of letters that you know flushes all of this out, I'm sure. Uh, but probably sometime in the early to mid-1820s, Paquette comes here, uh, most certainly hired by Joseph Roulette to manage this trading post for him. Uh, Paquette is in charge of this post until his death in 1836. Uh, he is, amongst other things, a local businessman as well. He is running the portage operations. Uh, as well. He has a business involved with that. He also is, speaks multiple languages, including French, and so he's involved as an interpreter. John Kinsey, who can speak six languages, uh, and hired Paquette uh, as an interpreter, possibly because of his knowledge of French, uh, which often was a diplomatic language on the frontier, uh, going back to the French times. Uh, but in one of these series of negotiations uh, that, in 1836, Negotiations and councils that would eventually lead to the Treaty of 1837, where the Ho-Chunk ceded all the remaining lands in Wisconsin. Uh, Paquette, uh, something happens at one of the councils, uh, and Paquette gets into an argument with a member of the Ho-Chunk tribe, and in the course of this disagreement, he is shot. Uh, and so, in 36, he's no longer uh, with the post. He's dead. Uh, what happens after that, I do not know. Is it run by John T. Laron? Is it run by another clerk? Uh, or is it within uh, quick succession that the American Fur Company assigns the post to this man, Jean uh, Jean or Jean Baptiste Dubé? Uh, we do know that Dubé is here uh, as by 1839, so within three years, Dubé is here. What happens within those three years, I've not been able to determine yet. Uh, but probably at some point prior to 39, he is here. Uh, at the Portage. 
Uh, he himself has uh, a, a solid background with both the American Fur Company and the fur trade. Uh, born, I believe it was, up in Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, his mother was Menominee. Uh, so he has a long association with the fur trade and the American Fur Company. Uh, he is here at the post until probably at least 1842. Uh, it's uh, in the 1830s, though, that, that uh, actually the post uh, becomes acquired. The land for the post uh, is actually acquired by the federal government, which is interesting. So both under Paquette and Dubay, they are operating a private business enterprise on federal land. The agency house, the fur trading post are all part of the Fort Winnebago Military Reserve. Uh, which I think is an interesting statement on the political influence of the American Fur Company that a significant quasi-monopoly could maintain their operations on government land. Uh, although, granted, you know, things, the rules were not you know, applied for so you know, kind of differently back uh, in those era. Uh, but anyway, it's just an interesting little side note. But Dubay remains here, actually, in Portage, I believe it is, until 1857, uh, until he's involved in a murder scandal. Uh, he's tried and acquitted. Uh, leaves for lands north, uh, lives out his life around Knowlton, where basically Lake Dubay covers his trading post and homestead up there, uh, dies uh, up in that neck of the woods, I believe. Uh, but the thing is that by 1842, the American Fur Company is no longer uh, the owner and operator of this trading post. Dubay is probably the last uh, chief trader operating here uh, at the post. Now, the Fur Company. Uh, is struggling in the late, mid to late 1830s, continues to struggle. Other prominence was in those years after the War of 1812. Uh, and when you think back to that map that I showed you, and think back to those other departments that I was mentioning, you know, granted, Wisconsin is yet largely undeveloped. By 1838, there is this map of Wisconsin that shows the land south of the Fox Wisconsin watershed already broken up by county boundary lines. The lands north of that are still uh, belonging to different Indian tribes. Now, but that's really implying that development is coming. South of here, the lead region is already fairly well covered by lead miners. Uh, and you know, the rather aggressive uh, trapping techniques uh, and, and pressure to reap those harvests of fur to sell to those fur companies and hat companies in Europe, uh, that's, that's tapping out the resources that are in the Western Great Lakes. And already, even by the 1820s, by 1822, when that Western Department is created, Astor is sending his traders farther and farther west to the upper Missouri, to the Rockies, back to the Columbia River in the Pacific Coast, farther up west to get into untapped fields to, to get at those harvests of fur. So when you think about that, this region is becoming more and more and more uh, essentially dried up. Uh, in terms of the product that they can extract from this area. So by 1834, the fur trade is largely played out uh, in Wisconsin. And so this post uh, cannot be a terribly active post, really, anymore. Astor himself sells off his interest in the American Fur Company by 1830. Uh, and it's Robert Stewart who buys up essentially the northern department and continues his operations. But those other posts are starting to diversify their operations. That place up in Duluth, Fond du Lac, as it was called at that point, becomes a fishing village. The American Fur Company starts to dabble in fishing on the Great Lakes as a hope to actually uh, meet and supplement their income. It's all to naught. By 1842, the company is bankrupt uh, and essentially is no more. Uh, some of the accounts I do find suggest that there is a trading post that remains here for a number of years yet, perhaps as late as 1841. I question whether or not that's an actual trading post. Uh, because what would they have been trading for uh, at this point? However, could it have been a mercantile operation? Uh, certainly. Uh, the Ho-Chunk were being removed out of this area, so who were they trading with? The Menominee were already being uh, confined to reservations up by Green Bay, so who were they trading with? Chances are uh, it's a mercantile operation of some form. What happens after that, I have yet to actually determine. So what did the buildings look like? Uh, and where were they precisely located? Uh, and now, as we talk in a minute, I'll actually, I learned a little bit something tonight uh, about the location uh, of, of the trading post. This, of course, is a very well-known lithograph uh, that accompanies Julia Kinsey's book, Wabun, based upon, I believe, a sketch or a painting that she did on site. Uh, of course, as I'm looking at it here, last time I was here, this wonderful mural was here, so we can have even a better visual uh, right off to our side here. Uh, but it does offer some tantalizing clues. There is uh, fairly good, at least up until I thought tonight, circumstantial evidence, uh, even more than so, 
uh, as I learned, uh, evidence that the trading post would have been located somewhere uh, in the vicinity of the parking lot or in the woods beyond the parking lot. Uh, there are two buildings that show up uh, in Kinsey's drawing. Uh, so, and these look like, if you compare to Kinsey's other drawings, of what is perhaps that log uh, former army barracks that she and John lived in when she first arrived in Wisconsin, what is possibly the blacksmith shop. This is a different color. This is white. We know that this building, which is white, is our building next door, is a clapboard sided structure. Now, you always have to look at images like this with a bit of a grain of salt, but if you're looking at that and are now reading these buildings, does this mean that this is a clapboard sided structure? Is this the trading post? Is this a storage barn? We do not know. But this does give us some ideas as to maybe where the trading post was located at and maybe, maybe what it looked like. We do have a physical description. John T. Laurent, who does come here in 1828, who did, at least we believe, for a brief time, maybe clerked uh, for um, or worked for Pierre Paquette, describes the trading post as a log house and barn at the east end of a portage. Uh, now, if we think back to that Kinsey image, this could be what that building looked like. It's not log, but this is an American fur company post that stood at Kakana, built by the Ducharme and Greeno families. Uh, Charles Greeno, Augustine Greeno, big fur trading families, big early Wisconsin families. Uh, had, uh, I think there was a Greeno tract here at Portage. Uh, their main operations were up at Green Bay and Kakana. This is their building. It does have uh, as it existed, now of course long gone. But it has some similarities to that possible frame structure that appeared in Kinsey's uh, drawing. Most likely, it could have looked like this building. Now this one, actually is one of my favorite sites in Prairie du Chien, and I'm always going to get the name wrong. Uh, the Francois Vertefuil House, I don't know, I do not speak French, so I'm always uh, messing up these terminologies. Uh, this is possibly the oldest surviving standing building in Wisconsin. Uh, Mary Antoine, who is the curator at Ville, at, uh, Ville Louis, uh, did a wonderful article on this uh, building in the Wisconsin Magazine of History. It dates back to 1810, uh, and it's, uh, it is of a quasi, I guess, French log structure. Uh, but when you think of when this post would have been established, uh, when we know that Joseph Roulette had acquired this property and this trading post in 1821, we don't know what he acquired when he came here. Was there already a standing structure? Well, no, he sold it to the American Fur Company. Joseph Roulette was already operating a trading post up here prior to 1821. He sells it to the Fur Company in 1821. So what structure is here prior to 1821? Let's also think about the other old log or old structure that's not too far away from here, the Surgeon's Quarters Building, which is not an army building, which what goes back to, what, 25, 22, if someone can tell me. But that's an 1820s era, I believe, or earlier log structure. Uh, so it's... 1819. 1819, there we go. Read the Army Survey. The Army Survey, thank you, thank you. Well, so if that structure is log, and that's a few years prior to when Roulette sells this to the American Fur Company. Uh, this is 1810. Now it has a log barn in the background. Uh, it's, I think, quite possible this is what the fur trading post here would have looked like. You know, a log trading post and a log storage barn or warehouse located nearby, close to each other, as per what, say, Kinsey's image uh, shows us. Now, where was it located? And here again is where I'm getting an education. Uh, I think a good historian is always willing to recognize that they don't know everything. They're always relearning and being taught things. Uh, this is the O.P. Williams map, 1835, Fort Winnebago. Many of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with this map. Uh, this actually shows uh, not only the fort, the location of the Indian Agency House and the blacksmith, but it mentions the existence of Dubay's trading post uh, pretty much online with the Indian Agency House between the Agency House and the river. Now, the one thing that is a discrepancy about this is that this map dates to 1835, possibly. This appears, at least the copy I know of, is in the 1880 history of Columbia County, I believe it is. It's printed in there. Uh, but, you know, where is that located? The fact that it's identified as Dubay's post, uh, Dubay did, and you know, that's prior to Paquette's death. Paquette dies in 36, so this is dated prior to Paquette's death, and it's identified as Dubay's post. So, perhaps Williams, or perhaps, uh, 
whoever later marked that map uh, got their dates wrong. Uh, but whoever has this is marking Dubay's trading post at this location, which, again, this is not to scale either. When you look at how these buildings are laid out uh, and the sizes of what we know, I mean, it's not bad. Uh, but uh, there are no, there are two, two buildings are not shown there, just one. But again, if you do an approximation, that places it somewhere probably in those woods beyond the parking lot. And as Adam was telling me, uh, it's Adam, right? Thank you, sir. I'm sorry. I'm terrible with names. Forgive me. Good, you know, absent-minded story there. Uh, that I am. Uh, but that there was the 1988 archaeological survey that did some diggings around the agency house. Uh, that was a survey that I tried to look for when I was writing the book. I was not able to get access to. Uh, they now have had access to and have had uh, some able to reading some of that. And that placed the fur trading post off into the woods uh, just beyond the, the parking lot. So my rough calculations, very rough, uh, possibly is correct. Uh, that that's where the trading post would be. So not too far from this spot uh, is where all this activity took place. So what would it have looked like perhaps inside? And this, uh, I did some searching online for museums that, uh, that do interpret the, uh, the fur trade. These are British mainly. Uh, you do have some wonderful sites up in Canada. You do have the Grand Portage. Uh, there are some nice interpretations of the fur trade up in Minnesota. Yes, sir? I'm just going to comment that I, I don't know if anybody has looked for foundations, but you know, with the, with the archaeological uh, capabilities, you know, with the search equipment, x-ray of soil, I mean, if there's a foundation, it should be easily that, you know, you can find it. Quite yeah. possibly. You know, and that's just, I think, and that's what they're, they're trying to do now with the blacksmith shop. It's yeah. using that ground radar penetration to find that. So all those are possible. Digging and and uh, the foundations, they had to have foundations with the winners. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Otherwise, uh, and, and these all these buildings, these French buildings were used, were built with tamarack blocks, which really the surgeon's quarters over there is original tamarack blocks, and you can see it's in pretty good shape. Well, and that's where, as I think maybe Adam can enlighten us uh, after the talk as to what there was some apparently discovery of it back in at least the 1980s or some reference to it. So, and but and but the building at Perry Machine, I might add. Is not on the original foundation. Has that been moved? I we always thought, and the state recognizes the uh, uh, surgeon's quarters as being the oldest building on the original foundation. Like there's older buildings up in Green Bay at Heritage Village. Yeah. That uh, you know are not on the original that foundation. That have been moved around. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of other buildings, barns and and, and uh, log buildings and some of the original German buildings, which I'm familiar with, coming from Milwaukee that you. And uh, uh, around uh, uh, that area, uh, and uh, so, but foundations tell a story. They do. They do indeed. They most certainly do indeed. Now, these are some images that we have that just can give a flavor for what this post may have looked like on the inside. Again, it's a trading establishment, so that the story would have had sundry supplies, ironwork, tinware, beads, cloth, uh, firearms, perhaps a living quarters for the clerks and also the warehouse where the bundles of furs would have been packed, marked, uh, and stored for shipment up to Mackinac Island. Well, this is just another image, again, it would show the activity as different Native Americans coming in from the different tribes would have interacted with the staff here uh, and trained the furs for the different uh, uh, materials that they would need. So in the end, uh, there's still a lot that I certainly don't know about the trading post here, and we'll certainly acknowledge that. Uh, although it's looking like this first question may be a bit moot, uh, but that the location is perhaps either known uh, or for, certainly could be easily identified. What did it really look like? There an archaeological survey perhaps uh, identifying either remnant tamarack logs or foundation work or some other physical evidence uh, to suggest that it was a log structure, though chances are it was uh, more than the frame structure. Are there any surviving records? And there, uh, there might be, but again, maybe not. Uh, there are several significant resources for the American Fur Company, Minnesota Historical Society, Wisconsin Historical Society, I believe the Burton Library at Detroit, Michigan have uh, significant uh, uh, collections of documents. Uh, one of the anecdotal stories I have with Pierre Poquette states that he did not actually keep records of his business, that everything was done and kept uh, up here. If that's the case, maybe his clerks, if he had clerks, would have written something down. Otherwise. 
Now, those years that he was administering the post, perhaps there's precious few records uh, of his time here. However, uh, Joseph Roulette, perhaps the Prairie du Chien offices, perhaps the Greenos, perhaps records from Green Bay show the activity uh, that was going on here or have uh, this post mentioned in their records. So not directly records from this post, but other sites talking about the business that is going on here. Certainly the records <coughs> excuse me, that would exist documenting the business from Mackinac Island, indicating what furs are coming out of this post must exist. Uh, and that actually, at some point, I would like to dig more into because how much business did this site really do? Uh, that is a question that I do have. Uh, when you think about, at the time that this post becomes a part of the American Fur Company, and I'm only speaking for the years as a part of the American Fur Company, not the years that it was involved with somebody else. Uh, but by 1821, I mean, again, most of the fur trading operations are pushing farther west. Yes, there is still active uh, trading going on here. And in 1821, the Ho-Chunk still had, uh, this is before uh, the Redbird Crisis of 1827, so this is at the heart of Ho-Chunk territory. The Menominee, you know, this is before all those treaties are taking into effect. So perhaps in those early 1820s, there's still a lot of business. But as the 20s are progressing, as the 30s are progressing, I'm imagining that the business did less and less and less and less and less. And I'm, I'm wondering if the records uh, would bear that out. What interaction did the agency have, or sorry, did the post have with the agency uh, or with Fort Winnebago? We do know that Paquette served as an interpreter for Kinsey. Was there more than that? Uh, you know, there, like I say, there was sometimes, I think, a love-hate relationship between the Federal Indian Department and the American Fur Company. Uh, and I think that went both ways. You know, so was it that they were, you know, sometimes easy, uneasy neighbors up here? But Kinsey was only here for a few years, really, before he moved on. What was John McCabe's relationship, you know, with, I think, with Paul Kett? Uh, what was the commandants at the Army Post? You know, after John McCabe, who follows up Kinsey, after he leaves, and the agency is managed by the commandant of the posts, what were their relationships? Did they find it annoying, you know, the fact that they had this business venture on federal property? You know, what was sold out of that trading post? One of the problems that every army post had on, the, on certainly the Wisconsin frontier was the sale of liquor, not necessarily just always to the Indians, that was a problem, but to the soldiers at the fort. That was always posing a discipline problem. Uh, and so did the trading post here sell that, you know, as well? We, we don't know. I don't think we know. Yes, ma'am. Um, I've been curator of Fort Winnebago Search and Scores for three years and done a lot of investigation on many of those topics. Mm -hmm. Pierre Coquette also ran a Portage business, which is in direct competition with Francois Leroy, who is yep. a descendant of Joseph Leroy from Green Bay, and built this building. And he, re the reason given that he sold it to the Army was the decline in the fur trade. You can see it in his records, which obviously don't exist. And so therefore, he sold that building to the Army, and it was run as a settler store, which was a, a, an arrangement under the US government to sell liquor, mm -hmm. things the Army did issue the soldiers yeah. so they could then when they got paid monthly the sutler sat with the paymaster of the army and was um, took his everything done on credit and then he got paid so um, so there's that that's that angle did something similar happen here you know and so that's again where I think maybe some of these records would help you know just flesh out or indeed to provide more detail uh, in that it, precisely too when did the post close? You know, when did there cease to be business operations here? When did it simply allow to go in, you know, to, to, to deteriorate? When was the, we know that the American Fur Company left. Hang on one second, and then I'll get all your questions. So, hang on, hang on, I'm almost done. But, uh, but so, you know, at that, that's the kind of thing where I think there's additional research that needs to be done. And like I say, I will always admit, uh, I certainly don't know uh, the answer to every question, or for that matter, know all the stories. Uh, that's what's wonderful job of being a historian is that you're always invited to give talks and learn something yourself. Uh, but that's why I think we're all here, and that is why we're all in this field, is to learn. So with that, I will admit I learned preparing for this. I will admit I have more to learn uh, in working for this. And with that, I thank you all for coming, and I'll happily answer any questions you may have. Yeah, 
Um, yes, you and then you. I was just going to say two, two things affected the fur trade. Number one, fewer beavers. Yes. Which was the main, you know, they would go after fox. But, and the fashion uh, industry uh, out of Paris that changed. Uh, instead of the beaver top hats, it was silk. And different things like that changed, and there was less of a need. And, and uh, so the same thing that happens today, fashion has changed. And a lot of it is to, to stimulate new markets. And uh, but uh, from what I understand, another big center of the trade and the transferring of pelts was, and we think of portage as being, but there was what's called land portage. Up, yeah. Did you just mention that? Yeah. Oh, okay. Farther up north. But there's yeah. But there's other centers like that around. I mean, this is just one post of many yeah. throughout Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan. You know, and as part you know, for all this region. So, a lot of this stuff is right I guess we're then. I've been looking for an author, someone who wants to write about the fur trade on the Fox River and Wisconsin system. And um, worked with um, also Heritage Hill, and they would like to see that. And obviously, Prairie Machine. So, you've got three centers here. That's where you no go. <laughs> no one's written a book in, on the history of this water. And there needs to be more explanations for it. Well, I tell you what, well, that's impossible. I will definitely keep that in mind. It's actually another subject that uh, we, we really forget that this is more modern time. But uh, Berlin, Wisconsin, was the fur and leather capital of the whole Midwest. Uh, not only was the fur taken there, but all the textile industry uh, was there for many years. So Berlin was really a key along the process. Good question. Yeah, the whole building on the side of the riverbed. I was thinking that myself. When, Could that be a That or, you know, is it, I, I don't know. I mean, it's a, I've seen other similar buildings in like a spring house or some other storage building or yeah, spring house. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'm going to just send it a debate. And we were always told that his father was in the area first. They went back to Rebay and then sent him to Boise. That's the possible. Um, I, I, you might you might be correct in that, but my understanding of it. You know, is that you it was said you had to stay with names. He was named, I believe, names was part of it. He, 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 we were always told his dad came to Syria first, and then he said to come back. Well, and that's that could very well be, and then it was perhaps after coming from here that's that he saw, you know, at Mary's Menominee, and or, and then that's I believe the debate. This this debate, I believe, was born in Sault Ste. Marie. Though. He had a post through, through, he had a post in Michigan first, mm -hmm. and he was such a good tra traveler because he was part of Indian, part of America, uh, was French, he came out from Canada, to be and then in Michigan. He was so good at his trade that Esther brought him out. Yes, 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 I do agree with you on that, absolutely, which is all, so he has a, again, that association with the fur business, and that story of Esther buying him out, you see that repeated, you know, throughout the, all these years. Is that you either they would either in a way muscle you out, or they would buy you. Uh, and and then I read one you. article where he was he built one of the first homes, houses, log cabins, or whatever in one of the towns in Michigan. I okay. also read that up there. I think you're correct in that as well. I think you're correct in that. And I think the site of his of the post home is actually under Lake Bay. It is, yes. So I was actually thinking of that site because I... You lived near there, so yeah. Well, when I was in college, I went off the road at the Lake Dubai exit and almost got killed in the car accident. Oh, yeah. so whenever I think of Dubai, I think of the how I almost, you know, died. Which is not a good memory. But, uh, yes, sir, you know, question. Would, would the canal have existed at the same time the, the post? No, that was... Why would it be on a map? Would the Indian Agency House have existed before the canal? Yes. Yeah, the canal itself, I believe, is yes, and so there was, and it was a long three stand. Canals. There were three canals. Three canals. One had no locks and therefore were dry, and then um, it was uh, a canal company in the 18, early 1850s. A lot of English settlers came into this area for that reason and settled at what was the old fort, Winnebago. Up there, 
proceeded to burn most of it down. And then in 1880, I think, there was another uh, renovation or improvement in the canal. 1870s. 1870s, yeah. But, and that's what that's the date I was associated with. This. Okay. But, but, but there were three canal companies and three attempts at construction. I mean, the map shows the, the canal and his training course. Yeah. Well, the, the thing is with that, let's go back to that map. So actually, the canal's not on here. I mean, and the canal might have obliterated it too. Well, the, the canal, the canal didn't exist in 1835. I know what. When they dug the canal, they might have dug it up. Well, that's also possible because you've got a kind of a crook there, of the agency house. But that's where, if that 1988 archaeological survey that was done here also found evidence of trading post down that area, which is what. I'm not sure. This is my speculation of its location is based off of the written descriptions and also. Did you, check, did, you, did, you check the, did you check the original survey? No, I did not. I've only it's seen not a, the original diagram. I've never seen this in this in place on top of it. So well, there is an original the diagram on the left, and then there's some drawing someone's done. Well, and one thing I will tell you is that in, if you go online to the Wisconsin Board of Commissioners of Public Lands, they have the original survey notes uh, and also the final survey plans. And when you look at it for this, this does not appear, actually. So, I mean, because this is at a, at a point that was, at, I think, several different townships. And so when you look at the sketch maps, which sometimes can be extremely revealing and wonderful, I mean, down to actually house locations and even, like there's one in 1839 of Sauk City that actually show farmer fields and fence lines and actual house structures. Now, I've looked and looked and looked for that because I also, you know, Fort Winnebago is a, is a pet project of mine for years as well. And looking at any surveys that go along, but also again, when I was digging into for the book, for the in agency house, I could not find actually any survey plats uh, that actually laid out. This is the only time where I've actually seen any survey plat that I know. And, and again, I'm not saying I've exhausted every record either. I emphasize that, but I've not seen any period maps uh, that actually show this, this what exact location. That's why I say this is a guesstimate. Is, is there an official map from the federal government of the how the the closest that I know of the Fort was Vega, The three the, there's several maps or drawings, diagrams, layouts of Fort Winnebago, uh, and but they don't show the agency house. Uh, there is the map that shows the um, military road. Uh, but it does not go this far off in the military road. Uh, so in terms of probably, again, I may stand corrected, I'll happily stand corrected if I'm wrong on this, uh, but the first federal maps would most likely be those U.S. survey maps that are available to the Wisconsin Board of Commissioners of Public Lands. And those are not, for whatever reason, this particular location uh, is not detailed enough, to my knowledge, uh, to show the locations of these buildings. That's not to say that there isn't a map out there, uh, and perhaps somewhere within the Wisconsin Historical Society, perhaps somewhere within the Burton Historical Library in Detroit, uh, perhaps somewhere within the National Archives. Uh, there may be as well. Uh, perhaps somewhere also within the confines of the papers of the American Fur Companies, there may be something. And when it came to researching the Indian Agency House, uh, and I looked at all the official records that survived from uh, the, at the, at the National Archives uh, for the records of the agency house. There's no sketches. And sometimes that would exist in other other agencies. Uh, Joseph Street, for example, who's the Indian agent at Prairie Machine in the 1820s, when he's outlining the causes for the Winnebago War of 1827, does a wonderful diagram map of the lead region, you know, and boundary lines with all the different treaties. There's nothing like that that I found that Kinsey created, uh, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, McCabe was here only for so long. Now another possibility would be the records of the Adjutant General and the actual official records of the War Department for Fort Winnebago. Uh, but those I've only not gotten to. The only thing I've gotten to in that case, uh, and I'll sure I won't take a question because I'll sort of lecture here uh, even more, uh, is within the Wisconsin Historical Society there are consolidated files uh, for the Quartermaster Department, which most likely would contain any drawings or maps uh, of of that post. You know, granted, the topographical office may have actually done some, uh, but the quartermaster of Fort Winnebago would have been most responsible for building that site and also laying out the plans. 
uh, the consolidated uh, records for Fort Winnebago actually I have a copy of all of them. There are no drawings in there of the agency house grounds. So that's that's the best I can tell you. Um, actually, tell you and Could you talk a little bit about your book? Because you said this is yeah, I don't know where I want you to Oh, okay. Yes, I tell you what. Let me get your question. Just, just a quick question. Talk about the book. Well, before he goes on to this, I'm going to pass this hat around. This beaver for hat. It's not really beaver fur. But um, I'm going to pass this around if you enjoyed tonight's talk and would like to see more of these. I'm just going to pass this around and then I'll get back to people. Okay. So, ma'am, would you have, or then I'll get back to There was a, an inborn kind of a conflict between the agency house and the court. What do I mean by that? The agency house was. The purpose was to administer the annuities, which were given to the federal money and given to the Indians. Of course, they would get all the money when they would get something to get a flying start there. Well, that, that's what we're going to do. Yeah. That's what we're going to do. I'll actually debate you on the conflict that we have with folks here. There were conflicts with Indian agents and the Army from time to time. The one conflict that I could determine between this agency and Kinsey specifically with the Army was in direct relation to when the, the, Army, the Indian agency was ordered to vaccinate uh, the Indians in the area. Uh, and Kinsey was wanting help and reached out to the, to the post surgeon uh, to help vaccinate the, the tribes. And the post surgeon refused to because the cost of it, he would have had to come essentially out of his budget. It was too much for him. So he said, I'm not helping. Uh, and there was some frustration with that, so Kinsey and Paquette uh, had to together uh, uh, vaccinate uh, the, the, the oh, about 600 of them, yeah. And so it was a gruesome practice. So I believe it was about 600. Uh, and so the and so I have not found any actual record of acrimony or or, or not even acrimony um, problems between Kinsey and the Army Post. If anything, there was sometimes uh, the Army Commandant Joseph Twiggs could be a bit heavy-handed. Uh, and there's a story where Kinsey wants to get to Chicago you know, and to survey out the lands because he's got important business down there. And he just, he first is going to leave in the middle of the winter. And Twiggs says, you are not. This At this point, Kinsey's not living here. He's living within the fort. So actually, Kinsey is living amongst the officers. Uh, and Twiggs threatens to shoot him or, or anybody who leaves the Army post in the middle of winter. Now, that's a bit heavy-handed tactics. But it's more out of the fact that he's trying to be an overprotective post commandant. Uh, I've not found any actual effect from Kinsey. Uh, usually the accounts are very, um, uh, are, are reflect his affable personality. There are complaints about Kinsey, though, from other Indian agents, and that certainly is the case. But then again, you're also talking about rather high strung personalities. I mean, one of them is Samuel Stambach, who's the Indian agent up at Green Bay. Uh, who I've done a lot into over the years, and he was a guy who you either loved or you hated. Uh, and so another is Joseph Street, uh, who complains about Kinsey, and is actually jealous of the fact that the independent Indian agency up here, which is a sub-agency, not a full agency, should be under his charge. You know, and it always rankles him, and he's always trying to essentially tell Kinsey what to do, and Kinsey is enough of his own guy and kind of ignores him. You know, so there's that kind of stuff, but now in other sites, Agents would sometimes conflict with army personnel, but usually it wasn't due to that I have found due to actual policy or procedure. It was due to personalities. Uh, Education was a big uh, differentiator back then, just as it is today. Most definitely. Most definitely. Yes, sir. Um, just curious. Uh, you said that you know the Indian agency was the Indian Jefferson Davis was the quartermaster at Fort Winnebago and was largely. One of the ones largely responsible for overseeing its construction in its early years. Um, there is often, I think, an overplay in terms of just you know his his presence here and, and was he here during the Black Hawk War? And, uh, he was not. He was, I believe, suffering malaria down on the family plantation down in Mississippi. Uh, but he was the post quartermaster, uh, and actually it's through his correspondence that we have drawings. Uh, for uh, the evolution of the Army Fort. We also have, through his correspondence, the reason why the Fort Palisade was never built. You know, so at the time of, of Black Hawk War, Fort Winnebago didn't have uh, any walls around it. It was not unusual for Army posts, but at that time they didn't because it was, they didn't have the budget for it. And this is in a time period when the United States actually pays off the national debt. 
Uh, and they do so. They do so because Jackson, whether you love him or hate him, you know, he had gone through the panic of 1819, and he was, you know, almost irrational to the point of we're paying off the national debt. And to the federal official, whether it's an Indian agent or whether it's an army officer that goes above his budget, is in some serious trouble. And that's why the annuity payments, why Kinsey, amongst others, would take that responsibility very seriously because if he had a miscalculation uh, in terms of his financial affairs, there were auditors uh, in the Treasury Department that would come after him. Samuel Stanbaugh, the Indian agent, Kinsey's contemporary up at Green Bay, uh, after he leaves office, the auditors ream right through him. You know, and he has troubles for years, uh, essentially coming to an accounting of his finances. Uh, so, but thinking back to Jefferson Davis, there's a letter in his papers, the whole first volume of Jefferson Davis's papers talk about really Fort Winnebago. Uh, and the, um, he mentions the fact that he's not, he can't build the palisade because he doesn't have money. Uh, so that's really, I think, more of his involvement in, in this area. Right, he didn't have love there, too. Well, he did, yes. There's, of course, that love. So. But indeed, so are there any other? I think not to be a shameless sense of self-promotion, yes, what more, um, which I'm very happy to talk about. It is the life and times of John Harris Kinsey. So it's a biography of John Kinsey. And so the agent that, that built this, he was the first agent here, the main agent here. Uh, the, uh, so he's only here for, what, about four and a half years. Uh, one of the challenges of researching John Kinsey is that a lot of the personal papers were, uh, were probably burned uh, in the Chicago Fire of 1871. Uh, he does make reference to actually a journal. Uh, and in fact, I think, no, I'm sorry, Juliet mentions his journal. She does a, a delivers an address before the Chicago Historical Society. So we do know where she refers to his journal uh, and interesting accounts in his journal. Uh, but this is a guy who you know, grew up in you know, Chicago and the Great Lakes Frontier, worked at Mackinac, and knew Stewart and Brooks, you know, was at the Treaty of 1825, was here in the Black Hawk War, so he knew Lewis Cass. Uh, personally, was the territorial governor. He knew um, many of the of the local leaders. Spoke six different Indian dialects. Uh, so it was. So basically, it's the story of his life through the story of his life and times. Because I could not find enough of his personal papers. There's anecdotal stories on him, uh, and there's Juliet's accounts, both in Law One and um, and in her historical sketch that's written in 1868. Uh, I view this as a compliment to Wabun. Wabun is Juliet's story, uh, and she is the principal character. John is an important but secondary character. He is the principal character in this, but it's her work that often fleshes out the stories, but there's pieces in here that, that Juliet starts the story but doesn't have all of it. So this is kind of what I view as a compliment to each other. Uh, my, my favorite example of that is actually when, when they're taking this trip in winter, that Twiggs is, is you know, going to threaten to shoot them to leave the fort. And they get into a snowstorm and they're lost. You know, and they find a fence roll and they follow it to a homestead. And it happens to be William S. Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton's son. Oh, right. Well, and, and Juliet mentions you know, it's, it's a wonderful experience or it's relatively positive. John and Mr. Hamilton go off and are, are gone for a while. You know, and then when they come back, you know, they spend the night. Well, just several months before, William S. Hamilton writes a series of scathing letters about John Kinsey to Kinsey's bosses about annuity payments. Uh, and so feeling that, that uh, I forget who it is, it was Hamilton. He felt that he was due more credit than he got in an annuity payment. Uh, and that Kinsey essentially took the side of some of the Ho-Chunk over his work. Uh, and slams the federal Indian Department, slams John Kinsey. And so in the middle of a snowstorm, you know, right around that time, who does Kinsey, the one cabin Kinsey falls upon is really messing up things. Now, do we know that, that did they have an argument? No. Uh, I mean, that's where, to some extent, with stories like Kinsey and others, you kind of have to, to make educated guesses. But my guess is, is that they knew they were going to be holed up in a cabin for the duration of a snowstorm, and so maybe they worked out their differences enough to get through the next day or so. You know why they took it to Chicago? Yeah, to get to Chicago so they could start surveying lands. In Chicago because the family had recently received a significant land grant, uh, in part due to his father's connection to the fur trade, his service as an interpreter, actually. Uh, he was a part-time Indian agent, but he was also a significant interpreter, and the family was there during the massacre of Chicago, and so and through their long presence, they got some 200 acres right at the mouth of the Chicago River. 
And so he was going back to start surveying that. Uh, and so that's also why when he leaves here in 1833, he has a place to go. Uh, he goes back to Chicago, and at that time, and he goes back, now he didn't know this was going to happen, but just as he happens to arrive back in Chicago, there's another treaty that's being negotiated. And that's the Treaty of Chicago that opens up uh, all of northwestern Illinois, southwestern Wisconsin, makes Chicago available for public sale and settlement. And within like three or four years, Chicago is a community of 4,000 people. You know, so I mean, the explosion of population, the boom that happens in Chicago happens right after Kinsey arrives. And the family has 200 acres right at the heart of Chicago. We're going to discuss it on a fall analysis. Yeah, so, so highly recommend it. Uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah. I do say it does look good on Oak Shelf. And this line looks wonderful as you're looking at your house. Uh, he got the name, he inherited the name from his father. His father had the name first, and it's Shawinaki, which means a silver man, and that comes from the annuity payments, because the annuity payments were made in silver specie or coin. Well, the federal government did have currency, but it was not consistent, and often hard coin, whether it was actually Spanish doubloons, uh, the double peeler of Hercules, Spanish doubloons, were often the main currency throughout the United States and the Indian frontier. There was also U.S. currency, I think you do see coins going back uh, to before the War of 1812, but they're not commonly, you know, circulated. Uh, and so the way to do a solid payment is in, in, in metal, uh, until the silver. So that, that's where that means. Thank you. So where are you from in Milwaukee, and how did you get into this uh, history stuff? Well, I come from Southside Milwaukee, Oak Creek and Franklin. Uh, my family has always been in Milwaukee you know, for many, many years. I've been obsessed with history since I was 10. My father was a high school history teacher. Uh, and he had history books around the house. And one of them was the American Heritage Pictorial History of the Civil War, which had wonderful battle maps for a 10-year-old. And I counted up all the dead soldiers. Killed <laughs> 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 in Gettysburg when I was 10 years old. But you know, it got the imagination going. And so from there, I got a master. I it was a major history major in Stevens Point, UW Stevens Point. And I knew I wanted to go in the history field somehow, I didn't know what, and maybe teaching, maybe museum work. So I went, and I worked for a while in the National Park Service. I, I did interpretation out of Petersburg National Battlefield. And I almost went into federal work. And if it wasn't for the hiring freeze in 1993, I was ready to go and become a full-time park major uh, doing historical interpretation. Uh, but I went to graduate school. And it was at graduate school that I fell in love with the Jackson and I was looking for a fresh subject to research, something that I didn't know anything about. If I'm going to learn historical methodology, start with a fresh subject and learn it all simultaneously. And in Eau Claire, at that point, there were several professors. One of them was Ronald Sachs, who wrote one of the classic books on Jacksonian Indian policy, American Indian policy in the Jacksonian era. It's one of the, if you're studying that subject, that's one of the ones that you have to read. And so I figured I've got several professors that are nationally known. And state known, one of my professors, a guy named James Oberly, who was involved in numerous court cases, especially with the nominee uh, at the time. And so I studied under those gentlemen, and that's how I got really into this. My master's thesis was on Samuel Stanbach and his Treaty of 1831. And so from there, it just kept on going. And um, I was able to stay in the field uh, by luck. My first job was the executive director of the Salt County Historical Society. I went from there. Uh, the Salt County Historical Society of America. And so I, that was my first job right out of graduate school. I, a lot of Germans there. A lot of Germans. A lot of Swiss, too, Swiss Germans. Because I married one of them. Like, <laughs> but I was there for eight and a half years and realized that archiving and working with paper and photographs and materials was what I was really interested in. So I went back and got a second, I got a second master's uh, in archives and records management. I worked at WHS for years. And Circus World was the first archives position within an hour driving radius of everybody that opened up and they hired. Uh, so now I'm learning all about circus history. I've been there for eight years. Uh, I love it. It's fascinating. I've uh, done a lot of research on Ringlingville, the winter quarters there. Uh, but when I go home at night, I still study Indian ages, you know, frontier Wisconsin. Uh, you put a clown outfit on them when you do that? Or? No. And don't ever <laughs> reach out to the boss. So uh, yeah, he's threatened. Whenever I take them off, he's starting to have me put on some sort of costume. Big, the big shoes and the big red nose. Yep. Never. 
<laughs> I admire that as an art form, but I will not do it. Well, thank, thanks for sharing what led up to this incredible I can't, I can't tell you this. Stuff, and that's fun for I people can't, like us to, oh, I, to have you uh, inform us and bring it to life. I, I will tell you this. I've, I've, done the, I've gone to the performances at Circus World. Of course, I have two children. You know, and my oldest is 13, and when my, my oldest was, I think he was 12, 9, I'm, I'm, in the, I'm in the crowd, right? I'm just watching with my boys during the summer. But I made the mistake of wearing my work shirt. I had a work shirt with the Circus World logo, and one of the clowns at the time, Roger the Clown, the great guy, saw me. Uh, and he pulls me out of the crowd and puts me into the performance. <laughs> uh, so I try not to go to the performances after that. You have to get into a real little car and stuff? Oh, no, no, they made me do a strategic striptease act. And so they, 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 it was all decent, but I had to take off stuff. And it was, uh, so at Circus World, you never know. So who manages Circus World now? Because wasn't mm -hmm. some years ago when the state of Wisconsin, Governor um, Walker didn't want that to be part of the... Well, there, there's, um, in 1959, the state has always owned this idea. Yeah. So when the museum was founded in 1959, a private entity put it together and then gifted everything to the state. And the state created an experimental operational model where they own the property, the collections, and everything there, the land, the buildings. But it was administered by a private nonprofit that was supposed to eventually administer all the other state sites, Bill and Louie, um, Old World Wisconsin. But as it turned out, state politics, uh, that those other sites remained state operational sites. The Circus World was the only private nonprofit operating a state site, and that was perfectly fine up until about 2009. Uh, the Great Circus Parade funded the museum quite well, uh, but the recession of 2009 killed the Great Circus Parade and then threw the museum into a financial slump. Uh, and the foundation that ran it had been struggling for years uh, to find the sufficient money to get us, especially through the winter months. The summer operations gets us through about nine months out of the year, but it was always three months or four months through the winter that was almost impossible to fund. And so starting in 2013, there were various efforts to get us into the state budget, since we were the only state site that did not have uh, state appropriations for operations. Uh, and ultimately, through fits and starts, that culminated in the budget cycle, the last budget cycle, where we were put in uh, again. Uh, and ultimately, it wasn't that Walker never wanted it. Walker always supported funds. Uh, but there was political stuff that got wrapped around it. The first two efforts didn't work through the state legislature. Uh, then finally, the third effort worked, but in the process, the state decided it's time to take the entire operation over as a state site. So starting January of last of 2018, all of the museum employees became state employees, and we are now in a transition period where we're figuring out what the foundation board's role is, and mainly a fundraising entity, but they went from a managerial role now to a friends group role, and the State Historical Society is learning about how you operate the circus role because we are a unique site even within other state sites. Uh, so we are a national historic site with our buildings. We have the largest collection of circus research material. My building uh, that I administer is the largest research center for circus history in the United States. Uh, there are no other collections that are. We have 10,000 lithographic posters. Uh, I have 900 films. You know, I have 3,000 cubic feet of manuscript records, 400,000 photos. There are several other significant collections, but nothing that size. Uh, and so getting that to fit within the mission of the Wisconsin Historical Society, so we're figuring each other out. That comes to the at the Circus World? Is it? That's my book. And so if you go to Circus World, uh, there is the main performance tent, there is the main exhibit building, there is the building with all the wagons. Behind the building with all the wagons, there is a cream, round corner brick building uh, that's not a part of the public tour. That's my building. And I have my own public entrance. Uh, and so we are this quiet back corner, but we are the collections facility for artifacts and for the research collections at the library. And we get people from all over. In fact, I got someone from Japan uh, coming. I got someone from Holland. Uh, I've had people from Germany. Uh, we have thousands of research parties throughout the year. Uh, so circus is a not just a popular subject amongst historians. There's a circus historical society, which has its own journal. Uh, uh -huh. But it's, uh, I mean, this is, this is an entertaining medium that goes back to 1793. 
uh, and in its heyday was the most popular form of entertainment in the United States with its stars like movie stars today. And also, as academic historians have discovered in the last 20 years, this has nothing to do with fur trade. Well, but the, uh, but the circus is a reflection of the society of entertainment. So historians looking at it as a mirror to the society and the economics of the era have rediscovered the circus. So we get a lot of people looking at that. So that's what I do in my day job. When I go home at night, I look at the agents. So. And now, country. So. Any other questions? Thank you all very much. Yeah. If anybody wants to know what I think that little door is, come back for a tour, and I will tell you my theory on that door, and you can see our new fur trade exhibit. Um, it's an interactive image door. There's a door in that picture over there. Oh, the thing in the main? What is yeah. that? I can't tell you. you got to come back for a tour, and I'll tell you the story.